gender activist who has been deeply involved in LGBTQ issues locally and nationally, particularly around the issues of aging and faith. She serves as Assistant Faith Work Director for the National LGBTQ Task Force, where her responsibilities include working for the full inclusion of trans persons in communities of faith. Barbara was heavily involved in the development of an LGBT senior housing project in Minneapolis called Spirit on Lake. The 46-unit affordable rental facility opened in September 2013. In 2016, Barbara was appointed by President Obama to his Faith-Based and Neighborhood Partnership Advisory Council, the first trans person ever to serve in that capacity. Barbara sits on the boards of a number of nonprofits that serve the LGBT community in the areas of philanthropy, training of senior care providers, and HIV-AIDS services. She's an active member of the United Church of Christ, having served on the denomination's Executive Council, and she was involved in the church's 2003 decision to affirm the inclusion of trans people in the full life and ministry of the UCC. Friends and colleagues, please give a warm welcome to Barbara Satton. Can you hear me? Yeah. Can you see me? Yes. 
because I have the feeling that I am invisible or becoming invisible. Um, we are in this throes of a time when the federal government, the administration, has decided that it's going to take older LGBT people out of the Older Americans Act annual survey and the Center for uh, Independent Living survey and out of the census. If they don't include us, what does that mean? It means that talk about this. It means that we're invisible, that we, that they don't have to hear our stories, they don't have to hear our needs, they don't have to hear uh, our conversations, what we feel is important. They don't need to know us. And if they don't know us, they can ignore us. Um, and that's their intent. So, I don't want us to be invisible, and so I'm going to spend a portion of the rest of my time making the invisible visible. My friend and author of Aging with Pride, Dr. Karen Fredrickson Golson, has identified three distinct generations of GLBT, LGBT, uh, older adults living in the U.S. The oldest cohort, Born in the, in the teens in the 1920s, she describes as the invisible cohort. The group born in the 30s and the 40s are the, the silence generation. And then the, those born in the 50s and the 60s are the pride generation. Well, with due respect to AARP and its decision to welcome you to the Asian community when you turn 50, uh, my contention is that the idea of old has dramatically changed over the past decades. Most of the people in their 50s and their 60s are still in their most active and productive times of their lives. And their lived experience as LGBT people is quite different from those in their 70s, 80s, and 90s, my cohort. I'm 82. I turn 83 in July. Uh, so I made a big distinction. How about you guys visit? How many people get distracted when they run into the internet, they run into uh, take this survey to find out something about, there was one about how long, what's your life expectancy? So I did it about a week ago. And I thought, okay, I'm in great health, I live a pretty good, frugal life, I, um, I'm going to throw the, the statistics out the window, and I started answering all these questions, it went on for a long, long time, and I'm doing really, really well, until I got to the answer, which was, my life expectancy is 83. Oh. <laughs> so if you don't see me in a couple of weeks... <laughs> But then I, discovered, then I discovered what they were getting at was the fact that, however, if you follow this procedure and, follow, and sign up for this system, you can, you can live to 92. Well, I'm not going to sign up for the system because I think my system's working very well. I make a big distinction between the current old and the new old, which would be probably the prior generation, the younger ones. In Minnesota, in 1993, we passed the Human Rights Protection for LGBT uh, people, and it included, for the first time ever, the trans community. Keep in mind, that's 23, 24 years ago, almost a quarter century, a generation. So the younger 
the, the, the new old, the 50s and the 60 year old, basically lived during a period of time in Minnesota where their civil rights were protected. As opposed to the old community who actually had grown old at a time when they didn't have those rights. So there was a significant change in the way in which people come to aging and the way in which they look for services from the aging community. The current old, my cohort, the, 80, the 70, 80, and 90 year old, come with a great deal of apprehension, great deal of concern, great deal of fear. You've heard this, they're, they're, many of them, their primary care physician is the emergency room because they're fearful of what's going to happen if somebody would ever discover that they're gay, lesbian, bisexual, or transgender. And it's also reflected in the people providing senior care services. They don't see us. Again, the invisibility. We, had, we did a number of surveys uh, now probably 15 years ago in which we talked to uh, care providers and asked them about the services and, that they provided for LGBT people. It was sort of like, we don't have any. No, no there aren't any queer people in our community, in our, in our service base. Why not? Probably because you've never made it welcoming for them to be out. On the other hand, particularly in Minnesota, we see the, the new old, the 50s and 60s year old, who are coming for services, not with the expectation of being treated invisibly, but with the expectation, you're going to, I'm here, you're going to treat me appropriately, or there will be uh, consequences. Uh, I think that's a wonderful place to be, but it's not a place where everybody is at the moment. Uh, but as the, one other thing that we also were able to identify uh, for service providers in the Twin City, Minnesota area, particularly Twin Cities, was the fact that we have a significant cohort of LGBT people who are um, 65 and older, 30, about 27 to 30,000 within the metropolitan area fall into that current category as old LGBT people. And all of a sudden the lights go on as the senior care provider is saying, oh, that's a market niche. Uh, you know, that's a reason for us to really rethink what we've talked about. And that has been, had a significant change. Now, what we're getting from the senior care providers is how do, how do we respond to that? How do we protect, how do we uh, get in place in a point where we can provide uh, responsible, uh, respectful services? By the way, I use the word old a lot. And a lot of people get really sort of uptight when I say old. Um, it's an appropriate word. It's a word that my friends and associates from Old Lesbians Organized for Change would stand up and say, yes, we're old. Um, it's a word that in other cultures is really respected. Um, we talked a little bit about that in, in one of the conversations here, about how the old community doesn't get the respect and understanding that it deserves, and is not able to share the wisdom that it has uh, for, the rest of the, for the rest of our community. So why can't we say old and feel the same pride in the wisdom, passion, and lived experience that old people bring to our lives? The progress that's been made in recent years on LGBT issues of equality and rights seem to be fading fast. Federal rules and executive orders that offer protection are being dismantled as we speak. Even the, proposed, the President's proposed budget threatens the safety and security of our most vulnerable LGBT populations. On the state level, 
Excuse me. On the state level, we see a myriad of bills aimed at making LGBT community communities young and old, making them the other. Bathroom bills aimed at the humanity of the trans community are just a sample of the laws that are being proposed across the country. I just read this a few moments ago that Texas is considering a special session of the legislature because they didn't get their bathroom bill passed. So they're going to call a special session of the Texas legislature back to try to enact a bathroom bill. Now, they didn't enact the bill not because there was a pushback against it, but because the bill that was being proposed wasn't harsh enough. Didn't require a providing uh, a birth certificate to show that you were using the appropriate bathroom. Come on. Aren't we better than that? Apparently not. In some places. Many members of the old LGBT cohort are living in a world that presents them with stark reminders of their past lived experiences. Remember that this is a community that lived through really difficult times where their sexual orientations or their gender identities were actually a threat to their lives or their abilities to live safely and productively in the world. They were called criminals by law enforcement, perverts by society, sickos by the medical community, and sinners by their faith communities. They were socially shunned and physically assaulted for being their real selves. So they did the only thing they could to protect themselves. They hid their real identities. They were truly the invisible generation. And for many, that experience has shaped their lives even today. A number of years ago, an organization that I helped form in Minneapolis called GLBT Generation uh, reached out to the old, LG, the old LGB community for, uh, as for Pride, uh, Twin City Pride. Many of the older don't, uh, members don't come to Pride simply because the Pride grounds in Minneapolis are so packed. And the parade is three hours long on this hot, sunny day, so they, they just don't feel connected. And we decided, well, let's have a pre prize social event. And the first year, we had maybe 15 people show up. The second year, um, the Star Tribune, our major uh, Minneapolis newspaper, did a story on gay and gray. And they talked about the issues that the community faced. And then at the end, the last couple of paragraphs, were about this free pride gathering. 75 people showed up, and we were thrilled. It also gave us to understand that a lot of the old LGBT community no longer read gay publications for a variety of reasons. They're looking at the daily newspaper, and they don't see much about the LGBT community. But the most important part of that episode that I want to look at was the fact at the end of the um, gathering, a man approached me and said, thank you so much for doing this. He said, I hope you can continue to do this. My partner passed away 14 years ago. I have not been out socially since. Because I didn't think there was any place that I could go. Where I could be well. Think about that. You talk about isolation. So, another example of the invisible becoming visible is a member of my church who actually got me started around aging issues. Gail was a trans woman who came to Spirit of the Lakes Church church I belong to, and on a Sunday evening at home, suffered a stroke. In order for Gail to get emergency service, Gail had to go back to being planned. 
and then was transferred from General, the General Hospital in Minneapolis to the VA. Again, had to continue to be Glenn. And in rehab, had to be Glenn. And we realized at the point of this that you know, nobody was talking. This was now probably 15 years ago. Nobody was talking about aging issues like this. Nobody was in our LGBT community was talking about this. Um, and we realized that this was a big gap that needed to be filled. And that was really where we began working to form the OBT generations to talk across generations around aging issues. And then we got into this whole idea of providing place, safe places for people to live, and which eventually gave rise to Spirit at Lake, the housing project that was referred to in, my, in the introduction. Glenn survived all of that. Gail is back, uh, still living well, uh, but really disconnected from the community. It had a great impact on her life. Um, and one of the other sad stories, I talked about Olaf. Uh, Annalene was a dear friend of mine that I shared the podium with many times talking around aging issues. Annalene was sort of the dynamo behind Olaf in Minneapolis, in, the, in Minnesota. And she always said, I don't want to do this. I'm a shy person, but I have to be sure that when I need services as an old LGBT person, that those services will be there for me and they will be appropriate. And she said it every single time because she wanted to be sure people understood the reason why she was doing this. Well, Annalie finally had need of services. But the unfortunate part was, the services were available, but Annalie's son, who had taken responsibility for her care, because Annalie was not able to do that anymore, wasn't allowing her to access those services. And I was called to see whether I could argue with him, convince him. And his response was, you know, that lesbian phase is behind her now. And I thought, oh, okay, so we work very hard to be sure that we have services in place. And somebody else makes a decision that just ignores that. And I can do with any of those. I'm not going to, but I just had to raise Annalie up as someone who you know, spent a great deal of time and energy doing something she really didn't want to do for a purpose that never came to be for her. And finally, in this conversation about making the invisible visible, I want to read an excerpt from an amazing eye-opening story done in March of 2016 in the San Francisco Chronicle entitled, Last Man Standing. If you haven't read it, Google it, read it, it's, it's heartbreaking, but it's really important. More than 30 years ago, when he learned he was infected with a virus that causes AIDS, Peter was certain his life was over. Since then, he had lost not just his lover and his friends, but his livelihood, his community, his home. But on this Christmas Eve, on the cusp of another new year, Peter was still here. 61, his beard flecked with gray, his eyes still a sparkling, youthful blue. A survivor of a plague that killed tens of thousands just like him. I am the 
grumpiest, unlucky person in the world, he often said, no one wants to be the last man standing. And we have many of those in our community. And you add to that the isolation that many of them feel, and we have a real challenging crisis on our hands among those who have lived and survived with AIDS. Finally, I want to talk a little bit about religious exemption, religious refusal, religious freedom. Today, we live in an environment where faith-based organizations provide a significant proportion of senior care. I found a citation in the New York Times that stated that there were 2,000 continuing care retirement communities in the U.S., with 80% of them owned and operated by nonprofit organizations. And 75% of those are run by faith-based entities. The idea of allowing religious organizations the right to deny services to individuals or groups based on deeply held religious convictions has morphed into now allowing individuals to claim that right to review service and not even requiring a deeply held conviction but rather allowing personal opinion to be an adequate rationale. We, I quake in fear of what this means for old LGBT brothers and sisters as they seek places to call home that will provide them with the services and care that they need in an environment that respects who they are rather than demeans their identities and orientations. These are challenging times. You know, many in, this, in the old community stayed in isolation simply because they were fearful that there was going to be pushback, that they were going to be find, find themselves back in this environment where they were vilified and demeaned. Guess what, folks? We are heading into that, and we have to stand firm against the invisibility, against the demeaning, and as care providers of whatever ilk you may be, as allies, as LGBT people yourselves, I ask you to be militant, strong, compassionate, and loving.